It's Monday. It's April 8th. And the word of the day is pandiculation, which means the act of yawning and stretching at the same time. Used in the sentence, when I take part in pandiculation, I usually end up making a noise that I'd describe as uh, curious pterodactyl. <laughs> ah, pandiculation. Do you know that's actually British for you are my guest and you have now overstayed your welcome. Uh, <laughs> see, I thought you were just really tired during QED. Ah, it can right. be both. It can be both. QED's <laughs> over. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center and across the pond, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, the world finds a new way to bug no illusions. We reveal Rishi Sunak's cunning plan to bankrupt every wealthy Tory racist. And it might be the end times because of the shadow. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall. And Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, it's Solar Eclipse Day as this is releasing. So happy uh, coincidence of geometry in space. Right. It is just geometry. I totally agree. I'll uh, co-sign that. You know, happy, <laughs> happy we're all in accord. Okay. That last one's a music <laughs> pun, Marsh. That doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. All right. Stupid. We're getting off on a tangent. In our lead story tonight, the sky has balls in it and they move around and depending on which part of the earth ball you're standing on occasionally a big sky ball gets blocked by a smaller sky ball for a second also known as a solar eclipse and people are losing their goddamn minds about it that includes spending exorbitant amounts of time and money traveling to one of those places on the earth ball and it also includes cosmic magical consequences such as we're all going to get superpowers like in Heroes, and we're all going to die in a giant apocalyptic orgy of violence. Right, but like worse than that, given that where it's best seen, it's going to be we're all going to die in a giant apocalyptic orgy of violence in Texas. Which, to be <laughs> yeah. fair, is, is a risk any time you go into Texas, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the Blackpool of the United States. You know, oh, they know what they're... <laughs> shots fired. I mean, no, it's it's Texas. There's going to have been some shots fired. I'm just right, yeah, no, yeah exactly. that's, that's natural. <laughs> and a big thanks to Preston for sending the link. Skeptocratnews at gmail.com if you want to help out. Wait, wait, wait. Preston gets credit for informing you about the eclipse. I kind of feel like he was beaten to the punch by, like, Edmund Haley or Thales of Militus <laughs> by quite a okay. while. Citation needed, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Preston also told us about the apocalypse, too, not just the eclipse. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> give Thalia of Manubola his due. <laughs> Probably a listener. Okay, so the idea of an eclipse bringing about the apocalypse is far from a new one. First of all, they rhyme, I just realized, and that's, wow, that's a big one <laughs> right there, apocalypse eclipse. So according to Mayan mythology, a solar eclipse would make a ghost army of zombies really mad and they devour all the living people on Earth. It, it might also be magical jaguars that do the devouring instead of the ghost army. Either way, human sacrifices had to be made to prevent a larger human sacrifice. And according to Norse mythology, there's a wolf named Skull who's constantly chasing the sun, or more importantly, the sun goddess Sol. And if Skull, the wolf, catches Sol, the goddess, he eats her. And that's bad because it brings about the end of the world called Ragnarok. So during a solar eclipse, people would make really loud noises, hoping that Skull would get distracted and drop Soul out of his mouth. So it was Soul chased by Skull. I mean, that, that makes sense. You start with the OK beer and then you move on to the really cheap stuff once you've, you're way too wasted to notice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right nowadays, Queen Heineken would get chased by the great wolf calling your ex crying. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So apparently lots of people in 2024 have not evolved in their belief system beyond Mayan and Norse mythology. They might have actually gone backwards. And of course, it's all thanks to the Bible. One of the biggest new theories is claiming the eclipse is going to bring about the biblical end times because the path of totality is going to pass over six to eight different towns called Nineveh. And Nineveh is also a town in the Bible. So, 
apocalypse. Some random extra guy in the Bible killed his two sons there in Nineveh, and a low-level prophet talked about Nineveh getting ruined by something at some point. That's the theory. But it's worth noting that, A, that's fucking dumb. And, well, that should be plenty of noting, but also, B, the path of totality is actually going to pass over two towns called Nineveh, not six to eight, maybe kind of close to those other ones they're talking about. It's also going to pass over a town called French Lick. Point being, town names don't matter. That's nothing. Right. And like, of course, the eclipse is going to pass over towns named after places in the Bible. Half the towns in America are named that way. Like, I think you've got 18 <laughs> Bethlehems around the country. You've got like a dozen Jerusalems. It'd be way more of a sign from God if the eclipse somehow managed to weave a path missing all of the weird Bible towns. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd be Christian. Okay. Then. But that does open up the possibility that Jesus might return to Jerusalem, Pennsylvania. And I am here for it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course... A whole bunch of crazy pastors are warning about the whole thing. Sword mouth Jesus, scorpion horse locusts, and the impending doom from the book of Revelation. My favorite panic sermon came from a guy named Perry Stone. That's the one who tried to speak in tongues to prove that he was possessed or whatever. <laughs> but then he got a text message and started reading the text message and forgot to keep, you know, really trying with the fake demon talk. So it turned into like a really bored demon singing along to deck the halls in a middle school chorus kind of angrily and in a snit. Yeah, he just started making the same noise over and over again. But you don't know, because like maybe the demon language just contains a lot of homonyms. And he was doing like the glossolalia equivalent of buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. It might be. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so according to that guy, we have several signs that the apocalypse is coming. First of all, there was a penumbral lunar eclipse two weeks ago, and it was during the holiday of Purim. Also... Passover is happening a, a, a couple weeks after the, the apocalypse. <laughs> and, you know, there's only like 75 Jewish holidays all year. So this is a big coincidence. <laughs> but most importantly, the eclipse is going to touch the new Madrid fault line. And if a fault line gets touched by a lack of photons, I guess it fucking explodes into a ball of fire. That's going to ruin all the train tracks that go across the country. And that means no more food somehow in in all of america like no food anywhere he said quote the railroad bridges connecting part of the west with the east coast are cut off the bridges for trucks to deliver food are cut off and the food supply would be diminished within probably i'd say within a few hours because everybody would panic in trying to get food in the stores end quote Okay, true story. I was writing a joke for this story at this paragraph break when the earthquake happened in New Jersey. And for just a second, I was like, okay, this is pretty <laughs> that's, funny. That's impressive. Like, that's impressive. I don't think Christians realize that if I die and am damned to hell, my last thought before eternal suffering is just going to be, hey, you got me. You got me. It's going to be really bad for me for like ever. Fuck. All right. <laughs> Podcast was fun though. And that brings us to the most compelling eclipse theory, the cosmic importance of a place called Carbondale, Illinois. Illinois, <laughs> Illinois, so, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> so here's the theory. In 2017, we had a solar eclipse that was visible in the US and the path of totality went from South Carolina to Oregon. And this time the path is going from Texas to Maine. And in both years, it went right over Carbondale, Illinois, because, well, non-parallel lines have a tendency to intersect sometimes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they say you, you only solar eclipse Carbondale twice in your career, you know, once on the way up and once on the way back down. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, the Bible doesn't mention this, but there's carbon all over the place in that book, technically. And maybe so some much. guy named Dale, we don't know. <laughs> Regardless, there is a TikTok video with about 10 million views that mentions this Carbondale convergence and claims that a nearby national park is probably going to have giants awaken from underground and cause a bunch of trouble. Obviously, the giants are going to cause a bunch yeah. of trouble. And God, my favorite part of this is the QAnon claim that the eclipse is in Carbondale because 
carbon has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. And Come so on. Six, six, Seriously? Six. Yeah. yeah. Also, they say the previous eclipse in Carbondale was in 2017, which is exactly six years, six months, six weeks, and six Wait. days before this one. <laughs> that's so stupid. <laughs> yes. Because that's that's six 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 six, yep, which yep, isn't yep, a one. thing. But also, like, why would you count six months and six weeks rather than say like <laughs> exactly. seven months, two weeks? But also, the greatest thing, it's like six years, six months, six weeks, and six days since the last eclipse would actually be April the 9th. So Satan is a day out. He's landed oh, a day late. I <laughs> just missed it. He shows up with a demon army into an empty camp field like the day after Burning Man. And he's like, all right, that's it. We're getting a Google calendar. All right. <laughs> I actually put it on the Google calendar and talked to you about the exact time that no, we'll be doing it. Um, I need you to call me every morning call. and remind me. God damn it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I guess Marsh we'll, is in a different time zone. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll see how it goes with that. Uh, if you're listening to this right now and it's during the apocalypse, I guess that's pretty funny, and I stand corrected. Yep, fat. <laughs> and speaking of shadow-based kaiju attacks and pestilent maelstroms of human extinction, pestilent maelstroms. We're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. So then Senior Pats gets banned from Twitter. But I, I guess my IP address is the same. So I had to appeal for my account as well. Right. Sure. Yeah. Hey, guys. What you doing? Um, yeah. Eli is having a little bit of trouble with the podcast of us. It's just a lot to manage. I mean, Inside Out Little Girl has a blog now and she's just posting every single day. Right. But like, you know, that's just all. Uh, Marsh? Marsh? No, no, I'm, I'm just saying. He could just do... Up, very... up, up, up. Eli, it sounds to me like you could use some help prioritizing the things that matter to you. Have you heard of BetterHelp Online Therapy by any chance? Therapy? For life priorities? That's right. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So no awkward therapist breakups? No awkward therapist breakups. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right, Heath, thanks. I mean, surely his mental health isn't that fragile. It's like a Fabergé egg, Marsh. Like a Fabergé egg. Okay, yeah. But not as valuable. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. Next up in headlines in Request Arrest of Detester Investor Hester News. There's a stick. <laughs> that took me so long to get right. <laughs> There is a stick that is often used to beat the Labour Party in the UK, which is that for all of its talk about diversity and equality, it's only been the Tory party who gave the keys to number 10 Downing Street over to women or people of colour. You know, Tories will say, look, we can't possibly be as bigoted as people say because look at our women and our minority. Um, and of course, what they miss <laughs> is, you know, they miss the point that Thatcher and Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, they haven't been champions of diversity. They're put into positions of power precisely so the party could claim to be progressive while carrying on being exactly as racist and misogynistic as they've always been. Yeah, they did affirmative action for the slur words, basically. That doesn't count <laughs> as of what you think it counts as. No. Yeah. Excuse me. Our guy got a whole cabin to himself. All right. A whole <laughs> cabin. So, case in point, the recent report that the biggest donor to the Conservative Party, a healthcare CEO by the name of Frank Hester, used a party meeting to call for the execution of the shadow health minister, Diane Abbott, singling yes. her out for her race and her gender. Because as The Guardian reported at a meeting in 2019, Hester said, quote, it's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on the TV and you just want to hate all black women because she's there. And I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot, unquote. Okay, so many great ways to call for an execution. That's not one of them, bud. <laughs> right. That's not one. And keep in mind, this is what he said at a meeting. 
right? That's the version he shared. What the fuck does this guy think privately? Right. So, like, Hester so far has donated £15 million to the Tory party, which I know doesn't sound a lot to American ears, but that's quite a lot of money in a country where political spending is very tightly capped. So for that's context, like one ad, that's less than an ad in the Super Bowl so for RFK talking ad, about yeah. his dead uncle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You guys do things wrong. I agree completely. <laughs> but for context, the Tory spent a total of sixteen and a half million pounds on the entire twenty nineteen election, and this guy has given them fifteen million pounds. And bear in mind, we've had three prime ministers since then, so he really got his money's worth from them. Yeah, no, it's like my dad at a buffet, right? Oh, racist. Dead. What? No, no. Do you got to get your money's worth? <laughs> he made me do help. So in fairness, Hester did apologize for the remarks five years after making them, only once they got found out. And even then, his apology wasn't great. He got his company to release a statement saying that he, quote, accepts that he was rude about Diane Abbott, but his criticism had nothing to do with her gender nor color of her skin, unquote. Yeah, slightly rude. And I have been slightly underdressed at live shows. It's the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, he has apologized, but he's apologized for being rude. Because when you're calling for someone to be shot due to their ethnicity and gender, you got to be pretty polite about it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and look, saying it had nothing to do with her gender or skin color, Hester... Tell that to the adjectives you used because you didn't say <laughs> right. that, you know, she makes you hate Londoners with history degrees or that you hate bespectable diabetics called Diane. You said she that she makes you hate people of her race and of her gender. It's like if I said that saying you made me hate, I don't know, people who look like Graham Linehan's wearing Stephen Colbert as a skin suit. It's pretty <laughs> clear by that point what my issue with you is. Right. Right. But Marsh would not ever mention the lotion in the basket scenario that he's thinking about right now because that <laughs> would be gauche, gauche and you have exactly, to be polite yes, about you. your rude being now there are many horrible in, racism <laughs> <laughs> now there are many in the Tory party who've argued that it's time for us to move on from these comments you know there's nothing to be done about them to which people have pointed out well there is something you could do you could, as a party, reject that £15 million donation for starters and make it clear that Hester's money is no longer welcome in the Tory party. That would be an easy thing to do, which is why Rishi Sunak's Tory party have announced they're happy to carry on accepting more money from Hester in the future. And look, I do get it, right? I get it. Because for one thing, the £15 million they received so far was in return for giving Hester's company preferential treatment when it came to lucrative contracts in healthcare. So if they gave him the money back now, it'd be like he got all of the pro for none of the quid. And that's not how it works in the business of government. Your emphasis <laughs> on the business there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that being said... I'd definitely keep his Patreon money if he signs up. We'll send you the link. It's just that I'm not a Tory is the difference. Like, yeah. the ends justify the means if you're not evil. Exactly. That's allowed. Yeah. I mean, look, look, for $15 million, we'll dress up like Diane and let Hester hunt us for sport. But political parties should be better than us. That's the problem, right? That they is should the problem. do better. But perhaps there is a more principled reason for taking the stance of saying we will keep accepting his money. Um, as the political editor of GB News, Tom Harwood, explained, he said, if you give Hester his money back, all you're doing is increasing the wealth of a racist. And while that might sound like the stupidest fucking thing anyone's ever pretended to believe, I think he's actually got a point there. I think Tom Harwood's right, because maybe all along Rishi Sunak's plan has been to very slowly make racists poorer by accepting their money in the form of political campaign donations. You know, maybe Rishi Sunak's Tory party is just looking to bankrupt every racist in the country one large donation at a time. Yeah, and that's why we're crushing it here in the U.S. We have no more racism because we have no cap on donations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Have you even thought of all the stuff the Koch brothers would be doing with their money if we hadn't let them ruin our democracy with it? Like, yeah, <laughs> it'd be bad. And if that is the plan, you know, I've got to say, hats off Rishi Sunak. Because while other people might look at you and see a spineless morality vacuum who's far too comfortable cozying up to the very people who will forever consider you a second-class citizen and then selling any sense of solidarity with people of colour the second there's a book to be made, personally, I just see you for the leader you really, truly are. <laughs> and in sick-of-the-sound news. <laughs> nice. If you're like me, 
and you like your diatribes over at The Scathing Atheist with an extra dose of rage, you're about to be in luck because our very own No Illusions, along with about a hundred million other Americans, are about to be visited by a literal biblical plague. That's right, Cicadageddon is upon us, and this one is going to be big. Okay, I like the noise they make as I'm falling asleep. They're oh, nice. yeah, yeah. It's like someone using a socket wrench way too enthusiastically. It's just really relaxing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, in you. a relaxing Marsh. way. Thank you, so, Marsh. That was for me. He was yeah. saying that for me. <laughs> if you're not familiar because you live on a sane planet that doesn't contain such obvious monsters that other planets would call us a little broad if we were a horror movie, cicadas are a worldwide phenomenon where every 13 to 17 years, about a trillion bugs, yes, that's the real number, I'm not exaggerating, rise from the depths of the earth where they have been slumbering and proceed to deafeningly shriek for an entire fucking season. And this year we got not one, but two broods emerging at once. The last time this happened was in 1803 and it freaked out Thomas Jefferson so much that he wrote about it in his gardening book. <laughs> okay, I like the idea of Thomas Jefferson trying to write his gardening book. And then running outside to yell cicada noises back at them all angrily. And then like stomping back inside and being like, and then I was like, I won that <laughs> argument against them. I won. Exactly. This is in the book now. And look, we're obviously not sympathetic to religion on this show, but if you have ever experienced this, it is completely understandable why ancient people thought this was a God punishment. Hell, I'm 4% sure it's a God punishment and I don't think God is real. Oh, God, yeah, honestly, like, a rat died in my backyard one one year, and we didn't realise that it was there and rotten, and just the number of flies that we got in the house for about two weeks, even that was enough to me make me feel a little bit like I needed to let your people go. I mean, I was stuck in Manchester. You did. You did. <laughs> Look, point is... Cicadas are the fucking worst, all right? They look like Mitch McConnell. They sound like a chainsaw doing a mean impersonation of a crying baby on a plane. And as I learned this week, thanks to the Associated Press article I read for this story, they pee harder than any other animal, and they what? get an STD that turns them into genitalless zombies. Okay, that was a weird day for one of every animal when they measured the pee force of all of them. Right, and also, like, what happens when they discover a new species? Like, how soon after the discovery do they have to have the now could you please pee into this tube conversation with the species? <laughs> or maybe they just, like, update the rankings once every year and, like, put out a new listing for Christmas like the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> exactly, yes. And Obscure uh, Species comes back to his buddies. He's like, listen, I had a weird fucking day. I, we've been <laughs> underground. They didn't know our names yet. And then my dick's out all of a sudden. We I should have know. stayed there. Yeah. <laughs> so a uh, quote from the AP here. In the study of urination flow rates of animals across the world, cicadas were clearly king, peeing two to three times stronger and faster than elephants and humans. They used video to record and measure the flow rate of their Amazon cousins, which topped out around 10 feet per second or three meters per second. Okay, also a weird day for the guy who had that job. Yeah. Strange. 100% just having to like picture up half of Noah's Ark like lined up to see who can pee the highest up the wall of the boat. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and remember that STD I talked about? Well, here's another quote. There's a deadly sexually transmitted disease, a fungus, that turns cicadas into zombies and causes their private parts to fall off. This white fungus takes over the male, their gonads are torn from their body, and chalky spores are spread around to nearby other cicadas. The insects are sterilized, not killed. This way the fungus uses the cicadas to spread to others. End quote. It sounds like they went to the same guy who did your vasectomy, Eli. Yeah, first of all, his name was Richard <laughs> Seaman, and it was worth it for the bit, Marsh. It was worth it for the bit. So, Okay, yeah. is the disease called C. rickets by any chance? Because that would be excellent. <laughs> so yeah, I guess if you're in the Southeast or the Midwest in the spring, and you're haunted by the constant cry of these assholes, you can comfort yourself knowing that around 10% just had their dicks fall off. And in granting certifiable news, hey, yeah. Supreme Court continued being six crazy people and three other people, and they agreed to hear the case of January 6th insurrectionist and radical Christian domestic terrorist Joseph Fisher, who definitely did a terrorism without question. But apparently it's not clear that he violated one of the laws that he 
very clearly violated thanks to a big legal dispute about the meaning of an extremely tricky word that we have in the English language called otherwise. It's a tricky word. So the case of Fisher v. United States is officially on the docket to begin on April 16th. Right. I think Fisher v. the United States is what he attempted to do on January the 6th, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. I'm going to say this carefully. For the record, if murdering me was the most meaningful thing a person could do for women's rights over the next 50 years, I would definitely want to keep that stuff illegal. I'm just, just pro <laughs> yeah. tip out there. <laughs> okay. So here's the background. Fisher took off from work to be in Washington on January 6th. And right before the attack, he texted his boss that he might need someone to post bail because the protest is likely to get violent. And apparently he was going to participate in that. And he did. He also texted exact words. They should storm the Capitol and drag all the Democrats sick into the street and have a mob trial. And then he went to the Capitol building where he yelled charge and then smashed into a line of Capitol police. And then he went inside the Capitol and made a video of himself committing like 19 felonies and posted that video on Facebook. So eventually the FBI showed up to explain like, wow, you're fucking stupid. We clearly arrest you now. You put a video of yourself doing that <laughs> on Facebook. We have Facebook too. But somehow more than three years later, here we are. And Fisher still hasn't been tried because a Trump appointed judge made a ruling that one of the charges against Fisher doesn't count. The law in question says that you're not allowed to obstruct an official proceeding of the government. A great example of that would be, I don't know, trying to stop the certification of a new president with a violent mob, maybe something like that. And yet somehow it's up for debate whether that law applies to Fisher's violent mobbing that he clearly did. Maybe they're just arguing that he's one guy, he can't be a mob. And then they'll just argue that same argument for each individual guy in the mob. And it's, it's going to be the first time that wave particle duality is going to be tested as a legal defense. Yeah. Or maybe they just mean like, come on, those hicks were never going to do anything. Rub some tussin in it. I'm a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, I mean, the Heisenberg uncertainty argument is better than what we're going to get here. So here's the full text of the law. It says, quote, whoever corruptly... One, alters, destroys, mutilates, or conceals a record, document, or other object, or attempts to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding, or two, otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding, or attempts to do so, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both, end quote. So Fisher and the violent mob didn't physically destroy a document that says, Biden is president now in crayon on paper, but they did otherwise obstruct the proceeding, obviously. But if you interpret the word otherwise to mean the opposite of otherwise, <laughs> then Fisher didn't break either part of the law. The dictionary, both regular ones and legal dictionaries, says it means in a different manner. That's the definition of otherwise. Pretty sure we all knew that. But according to the Trump appointed judge, Carl Nichols, part two of that law doesn't apply because otherwise actually means in a similar way, which is, again, the opposite of what it means. So Fisher didn't physically destroy a document, nor did he impede the proceeding by doing something very similar to physically destroying a document. Violent mobs are way different than ripping paper, so... The violent mob can't get in trouble for that. That is seriously the argument here. Okay, but like that entire law started with whoever corruptly does those things. Well, Fisher did all of those things, but with the noblest and purest of intentions, and <laughs> therefore he's not guilty. And somehow what I just said isn't that much stupider than the judge's actual opinion here. I would no, say it's yeah, way yeah. smarter. Yeah. Like Marsh should be in charge of this. He's come up with two that are better. So on the other side of the argument, other than dictionaries and common fucking sense, is the Department of Justice. They've charged approximately 330 defendants with violating that law, including Donald Trump and Joey Fisher. And according to their official court filing, uh, approximate quote, fucking duh. That being said, there's actually an existing precedent that supports the interpretation from Judge Nichols, the Trump appointee. In a case from 2015, a commercial fisherman caught some undersized groupers 
and he told a crew member to throw the small ones overboard so he wouldn't get in trouble. And that violated the law that says you're not allowed to, quote, alter, destroy, mutilate, conceal, cover up, falsify, or make a false entry in any record, document, or tangible object. And the Supreme Court had a big argument about whether a fish counts as a tangible object. What? Obviously, it is one, you know, according to the dictionary. <laughs> I mean, maybe there are metaphysical fish, but I don't think that's what we were talking about here. But a five to four majority of that Supreme Court in 2015 decided that tangible object was right next to record and document in the law. So the law was basically saying tangible object similar to a record or a document. And they're trying to use that similar argument in this one. So the judges argued that fish are, what, intangible, non-corporeal? Like by the judgment of the su Supreme Court, fish are essentially just piscine hypotheses. You know, emphasis on the C's in hypotheses. See, this is why we can't have a court system, people. All right, we need a RoboCop and we need one now. RoboCop 2024. <laughs> yeah, I would do it. I like it. So we'll see how it goes in a couple of weeks. 330 domestic terrorists are going to be able to avoid a major criminal charge if the Supreme Court fucks this up and rules that, you know, opposite day on the word otherwise. Assuming that opposite day doesn't mean otherwise day, it's going to get confusing. <laughs> we'll see what they do. I mean, to be fair, Heath, that would be bad, but it would also mean I could switch a lot of my Google Docs away from privacy settings. So pros and cons is what I'm saying. Pros and cons. And in E. coli River News, Fantastic. last weekend in the UK saw Oxford University take on Cambridge University in one of the longest running competitions in the history of our great nation. And I don't mean the race to find out which university gets to provide the next Prime Minister of the UK. No, because that one, it turns out, <laughs> already in the bag. Rishi yeah. Sunak, Keir Starmer both went to Oxford. As did Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, Ted Heath, Harold Wilson, Alec Douglas Home, Harold Macmillan, Anthony Eden and Clement Attlee. In fact, that takes us all the way back to Winston Churchill, in which case there's only been three prime ministers who didn't go to Oxford. And if you go all the way back to Robert Walpole, the first ever prime minister in 1721, 30 prime ministers have been Oxford educated, 13 went to Cambridge and just 15 didn't either of those things. Wow. Yeah, you are, you are like three times more likely to run this country if you went to one of those two expensive schools than if you didn't. You know, a bit of fun history to consider while you're sharpening your guillotine blades. Sure, sure. Also, it's got to be tough to be Cambridge there. Like, you're part of that evil stat, but you're not even winning at the evil. You got, like, <laughs> silver medal evil. It's like the Ron DeSantis of UK universities. That's yeah. got to be tough. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's like how Harvard has to admit that they made all those smart people, but they also made Ted Cruz. Like, if your bakery makes one out of four Cinnabons poison, I don't really care how awesome the other three are, right? You got <laughs> to stop poisoning those buns. Still, I was talking about a long-running competition, so by which I obviously mean the annual boat race that takes place on the Thames between 30 Prime Ministers University and 13 Prime Ministers University. <laughs> However, this traditional display of sporting rivalry was missing something this year. And no, I, I don't mean working class people. It never has those in any year. Okay, we don't get to row. Unchain me. I don't want to row anymore. You poors need to make up your mind about what you want, okay? <laughs> Doing our best. So instead, I'm talking about the, the tradition at the end of the race of the winning team dunking their cocks in the Thames. And you know, huh. if you're thinking that sounds filthy, don't worry. The cocks, C-O-X, is Got the it. name yep. of the little okay. guy at the front of the boat who yells instructions to the rowers. Because, you know, apparently athletes from the two universities in the country with an open door into 10 Downing Street need to be reminded which bit of the oar goes into the water and when. <laughs> yeah, the Cox is a weird position. It's like a maestro, but the entire symphony is just playing a piece called like drum, drum, <laughs> drum, drum. That's it. Still, if you had been thinking that the ducking of the cocks in the Thames sounded dirty, you actually, you would have been right this year because the, the reason this tradition has been banned this year is because Britain is full of shit. Or at least our waterways are completely full of shit. Uh, because, and that's because thanks to our laissez-faire environmental standards in the years since we opted out of all that red tape and bureaucracy of the EU, Britain's water companies just routinely dump raw sewage directly into our rivers and onto our beaches, as if they were trying to illustrate just how clearly 52% of the UK shat the bed in 2016. 
But unfortunately, since then, the rest of us have now been forced to sleep in that shitted bed. <laughs> okay. London literally made the same mistake in 1858. It's called The Great Stink. Mm-hmm. Sure did. And it's an episode of Citation Needed. Okay, the correct public policy is always don't be on Citation Needed. <laughs> yeah, but don't be on do. Citation Needed, yeah. According to the campaign group River Action, the Thames has so much E. coli floating in it from all the sewage that rowers were warned to cover up any blisters that they might have lest they get infected. And they were also told they had to wear footwear when getting in and out of their boat at the boat race, which saw the boat race actually saw Cambridge finishing first, narrowly ahead of a very large human turd. Um, and it turns out, turds, they just have like a very naturally streamlined shape. So they always had the advantage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look, Dynamic. Marsh, I know you don't like him, but if Boris Johnson wants to come and cheer on his alma mater, I think you can at <laughs> least name him. Okay. Also, I feel like don't have open sores should have been a thing already. Yep. Like I get that they're being mm-hmm. extra careful now, but like a year ago, w- would that not have been a problem too? <laughs> You'd have thought so. You would have thought so. Well, River Action even released a photo of a water sample taken from the Thames, which looks less like river water and more like the cheapest pint of Heineken you got served at the sketchiest bar in Amsterdam. <laughs> Although this, in the, in the vial, it's not low-strength lager, it's a vial of liquefied human shit, which ironically is something else you can also purchase at the sketchiest bar in Amsterdam. That's true. Sure, That's true. Yeah. sure. It'll probably have more fun drugs in it, though. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> that is very true. I don't know, London. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Uh, but of course, it's not just Londoners who get the, the joy of wading through effluence. Illegally ejected human waste is one of the few things London is actually oddly happy to share with the rest of the country, and at increasing rates. The latest figures showed that there were 3.6 million hours of faecal spillage in the UK in 2023, what? which is a rate that even Eli would consider to be indicative of a serious <laughs> problem. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're talking about sewage company spillage or like total human shitting but either way (laughs) if you ask me to talk about fecal spillage there's no way i would have said hours as a unit definitely not millions (laughs) of hours and that's where you and i differ heath marsh i thank you for your clarity absolutely inclusivity all the way that one Um, was for me you might wonder (laughs) how are the tory party responding to all of this well largely they're keeping their head down Though obviously not so far down that it's below the water level. They've learned their lesson on that. Sure. No, mostly the reason for their silence is that there was a proposed 2021 law that would have made it illegal for water companies to pump waste into our waterways. And that's a law that never went into effect because the Tories voted against it. Ooh, maybe they were just tired of being asked if they were taking the piss with their platform. So they started giving it, right? They're just, you know. <laughs> and so they got to do meanwhile, some Thames smell research <laughs> to <check out> this. <laughs> Eli, That's, Thames smell. I didn't get it. It's like stem cell. Oh, okay. It's good. There we go. Fuck so, all of you. Still didn't get it. <laughs> still didn't get it. I know it sounds like the other word, but I, it's fine. So me you know, during citation so. needed about this. I'm pretty sure I did the same thing, and people liked it. Whatever. <laughs> Fuck all of you. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're all just waiting for. Where's Richie Cecil? C- Cecil, cheers to you. He liked it. <laughs> he's giggling at home. He's giggling yeah, at home. Yeah, he's at home. He's it's loving fine. it. It's fine. He doesn't listen to podcasts. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're waiting for Rishi Sunak to announce when the next general election is going to be in the UK so we can finally send this feculent Tory government where they belong. And uh, when you do that, listeners, be sure to flush twice because these fuckers can float. (laughs) Yeah, sure can. Next up in headlines in a mellower form of Marsh News. While it was wonderful to meet folks at our Michigan live show this year, I have to admit that as I pushed my way through the herd of oxygen tanks lined up at slot machines at the Detroit MGM Grand, I couldn't help but think, man, this city is a little depressing. And this week, Motor City did nothing to dissuade me from that opinion as they invoked one of their city's most depressing traditions, the Great Marshmallow Drop. Okay, you don't like the soothing tone of a cicada and now you don't like marshmallows why do you hate joy what is happening (laughs) hear me out hear me out okay so the great marshmallow drop as it's called takes place annually at catapala oaks county park in southfield it's hosted by the oakland county parks department and is exactly what it sounds like the city flies a helicopter over a bunch of kids they drop fifteen thousand marshmallows on them and then they leave that is disgusting. Like, they don't even have the good grace to drop, like, a huge graham cracker either side of the city to make the world big or small. <laughs> Opportunity exactly, missed. Yeah. Give each kid a bar of chocolate. Now you're thinking. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Eli, do the kids 
eat the marshmallows that get dropped on the fucking ground at a <laughs> local park? And the good news is no, they don't. Uh, not only are they hitting the ground, they're hitting the ground in Detroit. So like 50% of them now have fentanyl on them. No. In, <laughs> okay, in a, you know some of those kids are eating some of those fucking marshmallows. Some of them are absolutely doing yes, it. No question. Yeah. So in a plot line so tragic, Dostoevsky would try to lighten it up a bit. The kids just collect the marshmallows and then trade them in for a prize bag containing candy, a coloring book, and a one-day pass to a water park. <laughs> a water park. Gross. Okay, the kids would ingest way less fentanyl and urine by eating the marshmallows off the ground than by going to a water park. That <laughs> yeah. is a terrible 100%. idea. 100%. Yeah. Well, one last thing about this story. 15,000 Way too few marshmallows. I yeah. know it sounds like a big number, but when you watch a video of this thing online, it is just wildly depressing. There's like a light dusting of marshmallows for less than a second. <laughs> and then these poor children begin trudging around to do the maintenance work like a horrible metaphor for climate change. It's the worst. And finally this week, in From Rags to Breaches news... Fantastic. <laughs> no, no roundup. Oh, that works even better written down, to be honest. No roundup of the most ridiculous political news coming out of the UK could possibly be complete without us talking about William Ragg, the Tory MP for Hazelgrove in Manchester and man whose comb over is somehow designed by generative AI. <laughs> Uh, podcast listener, Marsh has included a picture of this man in our notes, and he didn't even bother to match his own hair color somehow. I have no idea how this the works. The somehow has eight fingers. I don't even know what yeah. that means, it's rough. but it does. So Rag has been in the news after admitting that he used the gay dating app Grinder to sex with a stranger, and then to send that guy dick pics, at which point the stranger said... Thank you very much for the compromise, Mr. Senior Politician. I'd now like you to start divulging the personal information of your colleagues, which the Right Honourable William Ragg duly did. Wow. Okay, I've never understood this part, right? Because look, I'm not in the habit of sending anonymous people on the internet pictures of my hog. But if I was, I certainly wouldn't then get all shy about it, right? <laughs> Already parked, WilliamRaggsHog.com, Eli. Thank so you. Do what you want. So as a result, 12 as yet unnamed people, but including government ministers, received WhatsApp messages from an attractive young woman called Abigail, who really wanted to show her appreciation for their fine work in Westminster via the medium of unsolicited nudes. And Abby obviously wondered if the MPs wanted to reply in kind. And because this current crop of politicians is so profoundly gullible, at least two MPs responded by sending this stranger explicit photos of their own. Um, it's called being polite, Marsh. You're supposed to be British. <laughs> Reciprocity. Yeah. And sexy MILF Nigerian princes want to fuck sometimes, Marsh. That's a real thing. <laughs> you sometimes get a real one. This, this whole farce has apparently been going on since at least the start of 2023. And it obviously represents just an enormous breach of security, with senior political figures suggesting it's part of a honey trap attack by a foreign state. You think? No, yeah. you don't think. Right. And the thing is, like, of course those types of, of attacks exist, but you'd have hoped they'd need to be slightly more sophisticated than a text from a stranger promising, you know, nothing gets me wetter than being shown the blueprints to vital public service infrastructure. <laughs> but now, it turns out members of the current Tory government are perpetually on the cusp of handing over the nuclear cords to hot women in their area who need sex right now. <laughs> okay, to be clear, some of those are real too. <laughs> Honeypots used to be decades-long cons by highly trained foreign agents, not leaving a pot that I guess you could stick your dick into <laughs> near Downing Street. Okay, there was a lady in a train tunnel going into a mountain. I'm about to give her the nuclear codes, and then I bonked my head. I don't know what's <laughs> happening. A really fast bird ran away and laughed at me. What is happening today? And when asked about all of this, Rag said he was mortified at his actions and that he'd acted out of fear that the stranger would release explicit images of him. Which is especially stupid because finding a hot guy on Grinder and sending him consensual photos of your junk is the most relatable thing any Tory has done in the last <laughs> decade. Yeah. Whereas facilitating the blackmailing of his colleagues in a bid to save his own skin is the most Tory thing anyone has done in yep. way more than a decade. Yeah, he might as well have answered, would it help if I shat in the river? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as the first threat was ever made, Rag should have contacted the police and the Speaker of the House of Commons. 
And he can't argue that he didn't know he was meant to do that because he was definitely in the meeting in 2022 when Tory MPs were told specifically that is how they should respond to blackmail attempts. And we know he was in that meeting because he was the one giving that speech on how to deal with blackmail attempts. (laughs) Okay, the people running that honeypot just weeping with laughter that day passing around money paying off debts you got the guy you got the guy who gave the speech about how to not have this happen okay that's solid that's solid he's the don't get blackmailed guy who got blackmailed into being complicit in sex crimes that threaten national security and honestly that is more embarrassing than any photo he might have sent some dude on grinder by far (laughs) yeah yeah okay it's got to be an ugly penis like unthinkable (laughs) something crazy going on comb over yeah fake fake comb over. <laughs> oh yeah no the, the pubes are just rising up the back over the head of it i get it somehow a different color <laughs> all right on that lovely image we're gonna close it out thanks to michael marshall thanks to eli bosnick and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets please keep doing that please keep listening and please keep telling your friends and if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the generous new donors, you will be complimented by name next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes for your charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. That's right. Sitica dick. That's it's right. Cicada. That's right. Sicka. That's right. Sitica dick. That's right. Sicka. That's right. Cicada getting is upon us. And this one is going to be big. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.